everyone for being here today. We have our ESTAR webinar series, and I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Ruth Roberts to introduce our speaker. Uh, Dr. Ruth Roberts is the vice chair of HESI's board and also the head of the Biomarkers of Neurotoxicity Committee and a co-author with WIDA on the paper relating to this topic. So go ahead and turn over to you, Ruth. Thank you, Connie. It gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Weida Tong. Uh, Dr. Tong received his PhD in polymer chemistry from Fudan University in Shanghai, China in 1989 and completed his postdoctoral fellowship in computational chemistry at the University of Missouri in 1996. After that, he joined NCTR to develop a toxicological knowledge database for safety evaluation later becoming the director of the newly formed Center of Excellence for Bioinformatics. Later on in 2012, he was named the director of the Division of Bioinformatics and Biostats, and he's also a member of the Senior Biomedical Research Service, SBRS at FDA. He served in many science advisory boards on multinational projects across Europe and the US, and he holds several adjunct positions at universities such as Associate Professorship at Rutgers and a full professorship at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. Uh, as we all know, WIDA has been a, a very active participant in ESTAR and the former Genomics Committee for decades, um, particularly around toxicogenomics um, data related projects. From a personal perspective, I, I first met WIDA at the Molecular Mechanisms mechanisms GRC in 2015, where he came along and took a great interest in the posts and the data we were presenting. Um, and we had a great interaction. And since then, we've embarked on a long standing and very fruitful collaboration with Weider and his team at NCTR, um, working together on both developing new applications of AI, in AI. AI. communicating the power and potential of AI and machine learning approaches to the the wider community. Uh, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Weida Tong to you today, where he's going to talk about ToxGAN, an AI approach alternative to animal studies, a case study with toxicogenomics. Over to you, Weida. Luz, thank you. <clears throat> thank you very, very much for the kind introduction. And uh, let me see, I can begin to share my screen. I I think I already practiced once to how to share the screen, so should be good. Are you be able to see it? <clears throat> yes. All right, fantastic. Well, all right. I'm so I'm so glad to see all the familiar names. It's not all the faces, but to see all of these familiar names. And thank you very much to. Uh, I come to this in my presentations and also thank the Cyril uh, to in ask me to talk. So it's a, such a pleasure. And today I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence, um, uh, which is we have been doing for quite a long time now. And for this audience, of course, I don't need to really tell you and who we are and what we do. And I just want to point it out. And NCTR is one of the eight centers in the, in the FDA and we are mainly conduct the regulatory science research. And uh, we also um, picked a much better location to live. That was a Little Rock, Arkansas. And uh, within the NCTR, we have a, a six research division, uh, the Division of the Bioinformatics and the Biostatistics, which I'm a division director. Uh, just one of the six research division at the NCTR. We have a, a little bit over 50 people. Now it's close to 60 now. Uh, we are mainly uh, use or apply the computational methodologies uh, to the research area, which are important to the FDA, uh, such as like the drug safety and the toxicogenomics, which I'm going to talk about today. And we also have a quite a strong portfolio uh, related to the precision medicines, rare disease and drug repurposing. We've been doing the uh, endocrine disruptors for many, many years now. So um, as a division mainly focused on the bioinformatics and the biostatistics, it is uh, not even possible uh, to take a three step into our field without using some sort of the AI and the machine learning. So we've been doing the AI and machine learning for a long, long time. Um, this is just one of the papers we published about 10 years ago. 
and to assess a broader range of the uh, machine learning method and uh, for the genomics biomarker development. And uh, some of you actually in the audience and uh, participated in this project 10 years ago. So in the past, when we use the AI, we mainly focus on uh, the predictive side of the AI. That means and we apply that the AI and to the biological data, which is generated by the experiment and the platform, such as like a high throughput, uh, high throughput screening data or high content screening assay data or toxical genomics data. So we can use the AI to extract the patterns from this complex data set and to uh, provide the predictions or to serve as the genomics biomarkers. Um, th this type of application is still quite dominated uh, in my group. Uh, for example, recently we worked with CEDAR uh, to develop a broad range of the AI models uh, for the safety endpoints, which are important in the drug review process. And uh, this initiative called the Safety AI is uh, initiated by CEDAR and actually by Dr. Sharda Thakar, and uh, she is on the call as well. So, but this is not what I'm going to talk about today. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is, can we use the AI uh, to generate the experiment data in the first place, right? So if we will be able to do that, and that means in the future, we will be able to uh, replace the animal studies without the conducting and the animal experiment anymore. And of course, this is specifically important uh, in terms of uh, 21st century toxicology uh, for this audience, you are very much aware uh, there is a lot of things going on, uh, particularly when consider the animal studies because it is expensive, time consuming, labor intensive, and a lot of people just don't like to killing the animals. And uh, but most importantly, uh, the animal studies uh, does not really uh, provide a good predictions for the human safety. So there is a lot of things going on and in the world and in the Europe as well as in the United States. And uh, <clears throat> in that, for example, and we are trying to push forward and about that to replace and reduce and refine the animal use. And uh, in FDA, we also, <clears throat> apologize for that. So the, in the FDAs, and we also uh, released uh, the predictive toxicology roadmap, uh, which is promote the alternative methodology. And one of the, um, uh, the, the programs we established recently in FDA, I think it's pretty interesting, called ISTAN, and ISTAN stands for Innovative Science and Technology Approaches for the New Drugs which is to promote a, a variety of the alternative methodology, including the AI. So, so this talk is just really about how we can use the AI uh, to generate the animal data and which is to fit into uh, the general direction of the FDA I stand program. So this slide just summarize some of the AI methodology we use. I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, I just wanted to uh, draw your attention to the bottom left and one specific methodology, uh, which I'm going to talk about today, is called the Generative Adversarial Networks or, or, or GAN. If you have never really heard about the GAN, and you definitely heard about the deepfake, and then the deepfake is used the GAN algorithm. Uh, and that the deep fake is a technology and uh, make you say something or do something actually you have not done. Uh, and at least on the screen. So this technology has been introduced about four to five years ago and generated tremendous sensation in the scientific community and in the public as well. Uh, and of course, Hollywood jump in immediately and try to use this technology to shoot in the movies and a documentary. And for the deceased uh, actors and actresses, such as like Anthony Boudin shows in here. And also on um, this technology generate a lot of the concern because now this technology will be used to generate the fake news. Uh, 60 Minutes, uh, I think it's a couple months ago, 60 Minutes and uh, really they provided a lengthy discussion 
about the deep fake and how this is going to be impact the political directions we have in the United States. Uh, they used a, a term called the synthetic uh, media. <clears throat> And they even have a, a, a Congress even formed a, a special task force was led by Adam Schiff uh, to develop a policy how to deal with the, uh, the fake news from the deep fake and the technology. So if you take a closer look of the GAN algorithm, actually it's a pretty simple, at least at the conceptual level. And you have a two component, one called the generator, another one called the discriminator. So now generator was responsible to generate a fake image or fake news. Uh, the discriminator is going to compare the fake image against the real image. And if you, they see the difference and they're going to provide the input back to the generate for the generator improve themselves. So over the time, uh, the generator will be able to generate the fake image was so real, which cannot be separate or can be distinguished by discriminator when compared to the real image. So you can see this a general framework have a multiple applications. So what we do is we take a very close look of this general framework and we ask a question, see whether <clears throat> whether the, the generator will be able to generate the animal uh, study results uh, and so that we are not a bit, we are don't need to do the animal study anymore. So we call this a, an algorithm called a tox again and uh, and uh, I, I I'm pretty sure everyone knows how the animal study was done. And basically you treat the animal with the certain compounds at a different dose and different time points. And then you have the results. So what we do is we feed the chemical structure information and dose and time into the tox scan and ask a tox scan to generate and the fake test the results. And then the discriminator is going to be compare the generated the data against the real data and see how well and uh, that the, these two data are in agreement with each other. If it is not, uh, this information going to feed back for the talk scan for the self improvement. So we first tried this methodology you know, on the toxical genomics data. And uh, again, for this audience, you know very well how the toxical genomics was done. And basically you have animals or rats and treated by the certain compounds, different dose, different time point and then you generate the gene expression data. So once you have the gene expression data, we normally do two things. Uh, and the first, we do the mechanistic interpretation. Um, basically, we compare the treated animal versus control to determine which genes are differentially expressed. And then we use this information to understand that the underlying uh, mechanism of the toxicity. Or you can use the gene expression data for the toxicity and predictions. So and now what we are going to do is can we use the toxic and replace the animals and be able to generate the gene expression data, uh, which I still can be able to accomplish uh, two tasks, met mechanistic interpretation and the toxicity and the prediction. So this is a study design looks like, and we use the TGGase data, and we have a TGGase data have a, a a little bit less 140 compounds and uh, have three doses and a four time points. And uh, there is a, a, a the, the gene expression data is from the microarray experiment. And we took the 110 compounds and we use this as a training set to generate the tox gear models. And then we feed the test set information as including the chemical uh, structure descriptors and, uh, and the treatment conditions and give to the tox scan, ask the tox scan to generate the gene expression data for these 28 compounds. And then we compare uh, the generated data against the, the real gene expression data for this the test set. So the first thing we did is uh, just map the differentially expressed genes from the both real data and the tox scan data to the gene ontology and see how much they are in agreement to each other. If they agree each other, that means shows it's a green on this graph. If they are not, and it shows a different color such as the red and the blue, 
Now you can see, you know, uh, most of the places is green. So that means Toxigan indeed are capable of recapitulating uh, the, the significant gold terms. OK, so next we also um, the test the tox again for the biomarker development and applications. So in this part, we ask two critical questions. And the first question is, if we use the tox again to generate a set of the gene expression data, and then we use this gene expression data, develop a predictive models, how well are these models are going to be compared using the real gene expression data. So we separate these two parts as one for the scenario one and using the real data. And the second one is a scenario two using the generated data. And then we challenge both scenario using the same test set and see how the results are going to look like. So results shows on the right side. And first we look at the statistical measure that's on the accuracy, sensitivity and specificity. Uh, they are very much the similar. Uh, and the, the blue is a scenario number two, and yellow is a scenario number one. Uh, but I think that the most more convincing results is in the bottom because when we look at the test set, we have a six, uh, 46 and samples. And out of the 46 samples and the, the, the models from based on the generated data compared to the real data, they are actually in agreement and more than 90 uh, 90%, 93%. 90%. So this is a result is a pretty encouraging. So the second question we ask is, uh, well, since the gene expression uh, study, um, the, before we're using a microarray, nowadays we're using the RNA-seq, and there is a lot of the um, biomarkers uh, generated from the gene expression platforms already being approved. Uh, by the FDA in the clinical applications, even in the toxicity assessment. So you already have the biomarkers. So now if we use the tox again to generate the data, is that these existing biomarkers will be able to provide the correct diagnosis or prognosis and compared to the real data? So we did that. And these are the just the, base, the results based on the real data. Uh, this is the results based on the top scan data. And then you can see the results are also very much compatible. So uh, if you are working in this field uh, for a long time, you probably always uh, are struggling on one of the uh, very challenging fact is we call the uh, activity cliff. Uh, that means if you look at two chemicals, or we call the pair of the uh, chemicals. Uh, these two chemicals was uh, so similar, but uh, one is a uh, safe and another is not. And a good example is uh, ibuprofen uh, versus ibuprofenac. And uh, the, these two chemicals only have a one uh, a methyl group of difference, but ibuprofen has been on the market over 30 years now. It's extremely safe, I'm pretty much sure. And everyone and uh, on this call probably took the ibuprofen at least once in your lifetime. However, and the ibuprofenac and it's only on the market for two years was a withdrawal uh, from the market because it's starting to kill people. And another drug pair also uh, illustrated that the challenge in this area is the zopatin versus opatin. And these two chemicals look very, very similar. And the zopatin is used for Treatment of the insomnia. Uh, it's a very safe drug. So it was approved back in 1992 and uh, still in use, but opitin was withdrawn because um, the causing the liver transplantation. So we are asking question is uh, whether Toxigan will be able to provide a sufficient resolution to separate these kind of the drugs pairs. Uh, which chemical structurally very similar, but have the opposite toxicity and profile. So we are not to look at just one pair, we look at many, many pairs. And uh, let's just uh, using one in an example. Let's just using this one as, a, as an example. You can see these two chemicals is really similar. And the only difference is a, it's a, this one is a chlorine group, um, these chemicals is don't. And you can see if you look at the chemical structure similarity, and these two chemicals are very similar, and this is the red bar shows. But if you look at the 
gene expression data between these two chemicals and using the gene expression data to assess the, the similarity. Actually, it's not very high. This is the blue. No, actually, so that's the yellow one. Uh, the yellow one is based on the real gene expression data to assess the similarity between these two chemicals. But the blue one is the data generated uh, by the toxigan. And if you look at all of these pairs, you can see the blue and the yellow bond literally just go hand by hand. And for this chemical, it's even more dramatic because both blue bar and yellow bar go to the opposite direction when you look at these two chemicals. Now, why this is important? Well, we know that the read across has been playing a really, really important role in the risk assessment. And then the risk at the read across nowadays is mainly based on the chemical structure information. So now, as you see in the previous slides, if you based on the chemical structure information as a read across, and you might miss some of the uh, pairs which uh, the chemical structure are very similar, but have a opposite toxicity profile. So it is an ideal actually was being proposed by many people says we should be using the biological data. Of course, the come with it is the challenge. Uh, we do not have a biological data for all the chemicals we wanted to assess. So now you have the toxigan. And if you do not have the gene expression data, we can generate it for you. So basically, Toxigan will be able to generate the gene expression data to support the read across. Uh, as a matter of fact, in my group, and we are doing a uh, multiple project using the GAN. We're using the GAN to generate um, the, the a toxicity profile for the different organs, because when you look, when you do the read across, you just not just do liver alone. You, you also wanted to see what's happening in the kidney or heart. And we also uh, develop uh, the GAN models to generate the histopathology data uh, to support the read across. We also are uh, using so-called bird talks and to gen generate a text document uh, to support the read across. Uh, those are the projects that is ongoing. But the one project we just finished is called the animal GAN. Uh, that means we're using the GAN models to generate a real animal data or the conventional animal study data. So um, that the algorithm or the, at least the framework we use is very much the same as the tox gain. And uh, for the animal studies, you have a compounds, dose and time points. And then the readout is a typical uh, clinical chemistry and hematology data. So we feed the chemical structure information, dose and time point to the animal gain and ask the animal again to generate the clinical chemistry and the hematology data. Uh, and then we compare to the real data. Uh, and, uh, so we do many, many times. So in the end of the day, so we can we can we have the animal again, which are capable of to generate uh, the clinical chemistry and the hematology data. So this is the data set. And again, we took the data set from TG Gates and we look at a little bit over 8000 rats. Uh, those rats are associated with the different compounds and dose and time points. And uh, for each rat, we have 38 testing results. And uh, 17 is from the hematology measurement. Another one is 21 is from the clinical chemistry, such as like a, a liver enzyme, like ALT, AST, ALP, uh, total beta lubens. The compounds were uh, in this study was represented by um, close to like a 1900 molecular descriptors, which is including both on the 2D and the 3D and the chemical and descriptors. So the study design also very similar to the talks again, and uh, we, we divided the, the rats into two parts on uh, the 6442 rats is from uh, the 110 compounds was used to, to generate the animal gain. And the uh, 1636 rats is a service a test set. And, uh, and again, the information related to the rats in terms of the what particular, which particular chemicals was used to treat the rats, uh, along with the treatment condition uh, was fed into the animal, animal gain to generate uh, these uh, 31 um, 
the, the testing measurement, and then we compare the general data set with the uh, the real data set and see how well the animal gain is performed. Here's just one result, and um, let's just uh, take a closer look on the left side. Uh, this is a typical um, box plot and was preferred by statisticians, and we used the uh, root mean square distance to measure the real uh, the data from the real experiment versus the generated experiment. Um, let's just say you have an AOT measurement. Let's just say you, the, the, the real data says 281, and uh, the generated data say two, 289. So you, you, you look at the difference between the real data and the generated data using the mathematical formula called the root and mean square distance. And you can see on uh, the they are very close. And if you look at the, all the hundred uh, one thousand six hundred thirty six rats across all the measurement, uh, this is the results chosen here. And we also compared the benchmark results. That means we just took uh, any um, a distance between any two measurement for for every rat and the plot on here is a background noise. And you can see that there is a statistical um, a significance if you look at these results. On the right side, this is a very interesting um, plot. And um, essentially, and um, for each measurement, and um, we have the control rats, so we will be able to calculate the, the normal range uh, for every measurement we see. And then we ask the questions. If you look at the real data is and as well as the generated data, whether the real data and generated data fall into this normal range or outside of the normal range and or in agreement uh, or not. So the light blue show or green, I don't know what color you call it, but anyway, that shows it's in agreement. That means if the real data shows within the range, uh, the generated data also shows within the range. If the real data shows outside of the normal distribution, the generated data also show the outside of the normal distribution. That shows it's a, it's a, it's a light blue. Um, the red are those are disagreement, okay? So that's the result. Again, you can see a lot of the blue. And the next slide is summarized a little bit better. And uh, we just uh, took uh, the, some of the key measurement, which is useful for the hepatotoxicity assessment or for the uh, nephrotox assessment. And uh, in the left side, you can see the concordance all very high. The lowest one is the 96% of the concordance uh, between the real data versus the generated data. And for the nephrotox, the lowest one even much higher is close to the 98% of the concordance. Okay, so and now we sort of established uh, the, the accuracy uh, from the generated data. So now the next question we ask, okay, now how you can use these to generate in the real world applications? So we took the FDA guidance and the look at the different the threshold and uh, was defined by FDA guidance and when we assessing the hepatotoxicity. Uh, for example, if the AOT elevations is beyond uh, the, the, the normal range and uh, more than two times or more than one times, so they consider it's the minor hepatotoxicity is more than three times uh, that is considered as the intermediate hepatotoxicity. So, and then we look at the real data and see how many rats was falling into different threshold. And you can see, you know, we have 163 rats um, that have the AOT elevation um, beyond the, you know, abnormal uh, range is one uh, about one. And we have 175 from the generated data, and uh, but they are in agreement or overlap. It's 152. That means um, the, the, the their agreement is uh, around a little bit over 80 percent in concordance. Um, but for the other threshold, that is 100 percent is in agreement. And another one is about the daily pattern, and uh, that basically levels the big organs and. Uh, the, the, the injury can happen in the different fashions. 
So there is a hepatocellular injury and a prostatic injury or mixed. That's using the two um, uh, the liver enzyme to define uh, different uh, uh, daily patterns, AOT and AOP. This is what they use. This is the range, uh, looks like. So again, we look at the, uh, the, the rats uh, from, the, uh, from the real data, see how many they fall into this sort of the range and then compare to the generator data. And again, they are really uh, very much agreement and each other and very well. So the last one is about the some other uh, the liver enzyme because some of the some other liver enzyme actually is very important. For example, like a total belly lubin. And when we look at the AOT, we normally just measure how much damage the liver was uh, uh, the a drug was uh, on on the liver. And the total belly lubin is to measure how much it functions uh, the liver was. Uh, starting to lose. So again, you can see and uh, we normally using the uh, total belly rubens and about the two, you can see that 61 rats was falling into that range and the 65 rats uh, from the generator data was falling into that range. So the in agreement actually uh, limited over 77%, but others is much uh, much higher, so I use the lowest one to illustrate. It's not every parameters we get a 90% and accuracy. So we also look at the um, other threshold was defined by the international committee, uh, such as like a council for the international organizations of the medical science, and uh, we we look at all kinds of different and the cutoff has been used. Uh, in, 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 in the clinical assessment, and you can see that the agreement between the real and the generated data is very high. Okay, so now i um, come to summary. Um, I think that if there is one message um, uh, I can, uh, uh, you know, you can bring from my presentation and you can learn from my, this presentation, is that AI is not all about the predictions. Actually, AI can be used to generate the data. And uh, what I present here today is we use the game framework uh, to learn from the existing animal data and hopefully um, that kind of the models will be able to generate the future animal study data without conducting animal experiment. And I talk about uh, two models and talks again and the animal gains. And we feel these type of models are very useful, not only just to generate the data to gain and you know, to use this data to, to understand the underlying uh, mechanism of the toxicity, uh, but also uh, this type of the approach can be useful to support the read across uh, we call the read across again, or called the Reagan or Reagan or Reagan, whatever you call it. And uh, once we complete the full list of the GAN models, we can combine all of this information together uh, for the to support the read across. So with that, I would like to uh, take uh, this opportunity to thank those who contribute significantly uh, to this project. And first of all, I wanted to mention and one special AI uh, team was being established at the NCTR called the AI Research Force Team, or we call the Air Force. And uh, the, 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 the team was led by Dr. Chichar Liu, it's a technical lead uh, to this team. And he came up with all kinds of different weird ideas. And the talks again certainly is one of the, uh, the, his uh, initiatives. And uh, we have a postdoc, Dr. Shi Chen, and she was developing the both ToxGAN and Animal GAN. As I mentioned earlier, and we have a lot of the different projects that was going on, and Dr. Ken Lee was uh, developed the deep data and trans organ. And the, the deep data is a part of the uh, uh, safety AI initiatives and uh, led by Dr. Shwada Taka. And we also have uh, several other um, members and look at a, a variety of the AI approaches. For example, how we understand that the AI, uh, how we can assess that the evolving nature of the AI, because AI is, is not 
that's static and can be learned every time it's going to be improved by learning the new data is available. Uh, what that means and in terms of the regulatory decision making, because the regulatory decision making is based on a model, it's a fixed model. So Scott Connor was working on this one, and uh, I also uh, mentioned about a bird talks, which was uh, uh, carried out about another um, uh, team members, Dr. Lei Hong Hu. And also, I'd like to thank uh, the number of the people they provide the data and uh, uh, the input uh, to the model we developed. And uh, these names is very familiar to you, so I'm not going to go through it. And of course. Ruth and uh, Ruth has been working with us uh, for every project on the left side. So Ruth, thank you very much. And with that, um, I I would like to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you so much for that presentation. It was really fantastic, Wita. So I put in the chat, but if folks have questions, they can either write it in the chat or raise their hand. We're already starting to get some raised hands, so I'm gonna. Just go in the order I see. So, Richard, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, hi, hi, waiter, uh, Richard Brennan. Hey, Richard. Me. Well, um, what a great talk. I'm having a bit of an existential crisis. If you can, you know, use AI to simulate biological reality, are we really living in a, in a simulation after all? Um, but I was thinking about it, and uh, you know, the data that you're using to train these models is. Uh, you know, ultimately, in the in the bigger picture, of things is very constrained in terms of chemical space. Um, and how do you think this is going to work outside of that training chemical space with structures with, you know, different properties and and so on? Have you have you tested that with, you know, unusual chemicals or, or tried to restrict um, chemical space in the training and then test it outside that space? Excellent questions, and and Richard, so very glad to see you again. And uh, we did not uh, conduct an extensive study to look at chemicals, you know, chemistry space and how this can be impacted for performance. And uh, with that said, we did uh, uh, apply uh, that uh, because, you know, all the models we developed are based on the TGKs and data. So we extended the applications into the drug matrix. Uh, essentially, we did the models based on TGKs, and we looked at chemicals on the from the drug matrix, and particularly these chemicals is not part of the TGKs. And we looked at all of these results, and I did not present that part of the results. Actually, the results are extremely consistent, so perform very well. Um, if you use the chemical structure um, data. And I think at some point so we definitely needed to define the applicable capability domain, and that's for sure. Uh, we have not go that far yet, but this is a really good questions, and we need to think about how we're going to define the you know applicable capability domain and put some sort of the boundary around it. So in that way, and with the data we generated, probably it's much more. Uh, biologically reality, <laughs> it's not out of the whack or something. Thank you for the question. Yeah, thanks, Wada. Great. Go ahead, Zheng Gao. Hi, this is Xiang from Genesis. So we really nice work. Actually, Richard asked my question. So now I have a follow-up question. So we yeah, do you think if we try the Lynx data collection where we we have much larger compound collections and is that gonna be meaningful and helpful to expand the the predictability of oh, your model. Yes. Oh yes, absolutely. We are really, really welcome you to contribute on that part of the study. If you have a, a long list of the chemicals you wanted to take a look at, see how the talks again works, and, and that'd be fantastic. Oh, I'm, I'm just saying not uh, Genesis compound, I'm just saying the existing NIH links initiative, right? So they tested tens of thousands of compounds there already. If you're using that data to build your model, is that going to be meaningful? Because as Richard pointed out, and you explained, right, the TG gate or the drug matrix has a very limited number of compounds or conditions which limit the predictability 
both domain you have. I'm just thinking expand into the NH Lynx data collection. Definitely we can. I, I, I think we have not tried that yet. And if we can, you can look the link data and, uh, but the reason we have not tried their data set is because they use the cell lines. And uh, so from the toxicology um, point of view, if we be able to generate the animal data, um, and that seems to me is much more uh, useful. Uh, but yeah. I, I don't see any reason why not. And we can use the, you know, the, 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 the NIH have like a 10,000 of the compounds and then, you know, they generate the data using the variety of the gene expression platforms, as well as the different cell lines. And uh, I don't see why we cannot do that. But, it, but uh, yeah, we have not done, done that part yet. Okay, yeah, thanks. Great, thanks. I'm going to switch between the chat and hands now, just to be fair. So Rachel in the chat had a question. She asked about the TGGATES data set um, in which the types of tissues are limited. Can TOXCAN generate data or a tox profile for other tissue types? Oh my God, this is really, really good questions. And actually, this is exactly what we do. Uh, we are doing right now. And actually, the model was already came out. It's very well. That's what we call the transorgan. Um, project and the transorgan project essentially, and uh, we talk on uh, the data from the liver, and we ask the question whether we will be able to generate the data from the kidney for the kidney or vice versa. Uh, the reason we wanted to do this project because we know, um, and during the animal studies, you will not be able to look at all the organs, and you normally just pick, you know focus on a couple organs, and also, and um, it become extremely expensive if you do the Let's just say to the uh, RNA seq uh, on all the organs. So we are asking the questions is on whether we will be able to uh, to base on the data from the one organ and then transfer the results to the another organ. Yes, we are doing that right now. Actually, we already have the first set of the results came out, and we are starting to write in the paper called the transorgan uh, paper. Rachel, did you have a follow-up? No, I just want to thank Weda. Thank you so much. Great, thank yeah, you. Thank looking you. forward to see the paper. <laughs> right, thanks for the question. All right, Scott, you have your hand up. Do you want to go ahead? Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh huh. So Weda, I was really, again, awesome. So I love the animal again. That is uh, brilliant because it's getting at this issue. You can see me? I guess you can't see me, sorry. <clears throat> sitting in my exercise room. Um, so the the challenge that you run into, like you, you place the GAN in place of the animals, right? And there's 40 tissues and gross observations to get the safety, right? Like that's what, you know, so you're, you're talking about, you know, in order to convince your colleagues that are you know, allow someone to put a chemical into humans at pharmacological doses, they want to know everything. Are they going to go blind? Is their liver going to fail? Kidneys going to fail? And so how are you thinking about, because really ultimately the three R's ideally would be about you know, eliminating animal studies, like you're saying. You can use the GAN to actually generate the equivalent of a 28-day report for any chemical, in class, out of class, whatever it may be. And so how are you thinking about that? You have the trans organ, but getting to that level of being able to predict the adrenal glands when you don't have any adrenal data, you know, um, are your colleagues at FDA going to grant you access to subchronic and subacute studies from all the drugs they've approved or not approved, so you can have that training set? <laughs> Excellent questions. Actually, this is exactly what we are doing right now, and uh, the Shraddha probably can uh, chime in. And the Shraddha was uh, um, uh, working at the Cedar, and uh, she is in charge of the uh, Janus database. Not, not she is in charge, but they have what's called the Janus database for the non-clinical data. And that means all the IND submissions and uh, this data are going to be kept there. And most of them is the 28 day and the studies and uh, with the different IND submissions. So um, there's a little bit more on 10,000 animal data. So right there, and we are trying to access this data set to develop the animal again. 
Um, and uh, but you can see it's a it's a it's a it's a little bit of struggling because those are the regulatory data and uh, belong to the industry actually, not belong to the FDA. So there is a lot of the hoops we need to to overcome. And one of the scientists in that in the in the, in the, uh, in the cedar, and he eventually managed to get the, uh, some of these data, but not the entire description of the, these data. So we are working on it. And I really think and the FDA hold that data is extremely valuable for the AI because what we want to do is learn yeah. from the existing data. And then in the future, we will be able to guide it, you know, uh, the, you know, when you pr produce the new data. So, yeah, great question, Scott. Good to see you again. See you too, sir. Great, thanks, Scott. So switching back to the chat, uh, Talita had a similar question. Um, is there a timeline expected to potentially gain regulatory acceptance for at least some of these parameters for animal replacement? Okay, so the timeline, uh, I can tell you what we wanted to do. And the, the timeline probably is a very difficult uh, question to answer. So as I mentioned, we have I stand. Um, program and I stand programs is a qualify a certain methodologies and which are going to be useful to facilitate the drug development. And uh, so the, the idea behind it is I think the, the most incentive from this uh, uh, from this program is once on uh, the in silico models have been qualified by I stand and then in the future the data generated using that models and uh, not require the further validation or verification. So this is a huge incentive. So what we intended to do is we want to get these toxic game models or animal game models uh, through this I stand qualification process. This is the lengthy process um, and uh, I think uh, two years is, 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 is uh, at the minimum probably going to three or four years. So I really don't know, but you won't expect anything to happen. Even I submit, submit the model to the I stand today. Great, great, thank you. Um, so Demitar, you have your hand up. Do you want to go ahead? Yeah, thank you. Great work, great, great talk. Thank you very much. I have actually two Questions. The first one is: Have you tested the um, minimum amount of data that is needed to accurately, relatively accurately, generate new data? Uh, no, and uh, actually, we did not like a varying the data size and to see how the talks again going to uh, perform. No, we have not done that part. And I think what we did is just using. 20, 80 percent, you know, 20, 80 split is normally we do. Um, the, I think this is a very good suggestion and the, probably we do we do need to do that and the 30, 70 split, see how well that are going to be performed. Well, thanks for that question. Yeah, I was just wondering if there is like a, some kind of a minimum that you would think that it's required to generate data accurately. And my second question is, um is the code on github that i found uh up to date re uh, with respect to what you were uh presenting today could you say it again is the code on github uh yes on talkscan that's that's up to date in terms of what yeah. you were uh, showing today right yeah we have not made any changes yet yes go ahead to play around if you have any questions let us know that is amazing thank you very much mm -hmm. Great. Heading back to the chat, Amy had a question kind of going along with Rachel's. Um, what about toxicities in animals that are less common, such as retinal or adrenal? And she also asked about non-rodents. Well, um, the, the, what we did, I think that the, what we did in the trans organ, uh, this all depends on what, whether the, the real data is available to us or not. And the algorithm is a, a fairly generic, right? And so, if you have the data, um, let me take a step back and see what we uh, tell you what we did. And for example, we do the trans organ, and we look at the ten 
tissue. I think it's a liver, heart, and a kidney, something. I, I, I cannot remember all these 10. And, and then we look at the different age of the rats and from the young all the way to old. And we also look at the male and the female. So the data set is fairly large. And uh, we, we, we did it for rats. Um, that the reason we do the rats and then, uh, uh, our motivation is uh, in the future, the trans organ will be able to integrate it with the rest of the models. However, um, there is the human body map um, a data set that's available. There is a much more like a 30 or 40 of the organs. So if we apply our trans organ to that human data set, we might be able to, to address the questions you just asked. But for the model, I'm pretty much sure the model we are developing right now is not cover uh, these two organs um, that she just mentioned. Great, thanks, Wida. Okay, Strata, you have your hand up. Do you want to go ahead? Hi, Dr. Tong, excellent presentation. I want to know um, if you compare a multiple organ, is there a particular organ it's easy for GAN um, compared to others or they uh, perform equally? Hmm. Good question. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know which organ was a little bit easier. Now, I'm thinking um, if you are developing a model based on one organ and infer the results for another organ, if these two organs are really connected to each other, and uh, such as like the liver and the kidney, they are sort of the work in the console, uh, that might be the results a little bit more accurate. And I even think that the liver to the brain um, probably also going to work a, a better well because a lot of the uh, neurotransmitters actually was generated from the liver and deliver all the way to the brain. So I assume um, if there is uh, intrinsic connections between these two organs in terms of the biology and that the, the, the trans organ will be able to perform better. Uh, from one organ. If it's two organs that have no relationship at all, uh, I, I, I hardly see how the trans organ is going to work. But this is a really good question, and so I'm probably going to pay a little bit more attention on how that is going to work. Thank you. Thanks. Excellent presentation as usual. Yeah, thanks for the question. All right, a couple more questions. So one in the chat, Oh, I'll say one thing first. Cyril put in the chat um, the paper for that corresponds to this presentation. If folks want to go and read that and do a deeper dive, and she also put in the FDA qualification process. So thanks, Cyril, for that. But then, um, question from David. He wanted to ask about um, with animal GAN with animal studies increasing length. Um, so commenting on the concordance of acute versus subchronic versus chronic studies. Could you repeat the question again? You said. OK, I'll, I'll read directly what he wrote. So what is the predictability concordance of animal gun with animal studies of con of increasing length? So for example, acute versus subchronic versus chronic studies. Um, we certainly did not differentiate the acute or chronic because those are the definition on the, you know, what what is the chronic, what is acute. But the model we use, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the data we use is the, is the uh, four different time treatment duration. So we can say there's like a 28 days treatment duration. So now I assume whatever you observe on the 28 days, you can see there's a more like a chronic. And we also have a 14 days. Uh, we have a seven days. We have four days. So when we develop the, um, the animal GANs, we essentially using on uh, the animals in these four different uh, treatment durations. So I hope this is answers the question. Yeah, I think yeah. as well, it's so it's restricted by what the date, what the data are available. We weren't able to look at six months or chronic long-term or CARC studies or any of those longer-term endpoints were we because the data are, are what they are and we can only analyze what exists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, well, and I, I probably can add a little bit more clarification here is, uh, um, I mean, let me show this slides. I think it is going to be interesting. Um, we also um, apply the animal game because animal game based on the data from uh, uh, from TG Gates as well. We apply to the drug matrix. And uh, here I'm like, uh, thanks to Scott and to provide all the data for us to do this work. And if you look at the drug matrix, treatment duration is pretty awkward. And you get like, uh, this is all acute, essentially just one single dose. And then you move to the three days, four days, five days, and seven days, you're starting to do a uh, repeated dose treatment. And, uh, but the data, the animal gain was, was uh, um, trained on the data is the repeated dose of studies, so three days, seven days, 14 days, 28 days. And we didn't then ask the question. So they say, okay, this is, uh, uh, this kind of the repeated dose treatment, uh, the models are be able to predict uh, the results from the acute in a way, it's a single dose treatment. Actually, results is pretty consistent, and we are really kind of surprised. And so, this is really all the way come back to the applicability domain we talk about. And uh, uh, Richard was asking, but he is more focused on the chemistry space. But even the treatment duration and also is another applicability domain uh, to be considered. But so far, what we found, and, and it's actually it's pretty good. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. So we're we're getting pretty close on time. I'm gonna let one more question go. So Falgon, I see your hand up. Do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Veda, and nice to see you um, uh, virtually again. Um, so I have actually two questions. So for your tra the the organ uh, approach, um, have you noticed any correlations between you know if you see toxicity in let's say liver? You will always see toxicity or or you have a higher probability of seeing toxicity in other organ, right? So just kind of comparing toxicity phenotype or the co-occurrence of uh, um, toxicity phenotypes. Yes, we do. And uh, actually the data set we are playing around right now is, has been published a couple of times and from my, from my uh, group and I think it's one of them saying the nature communication. And uh, there is a certain uh, a correlations between different organs in terms of the gene expression data. And also uh, not relevant to this data set, if you look at the uh, drug-induced liver injury, which is uh, uh, my group did a lot of the work in this area. And we do notice, you know, for example, um, a drugs cause liver injury and the normally cause the hypertension as well. So there is clearly, and when, when the drug come to your body, it can do damage in multiple places. And uh, not, it's the damage in multiple places, not in the equal uh, severity. And when we say this, is, this drug has caused liver injury, simply because this is the a particular uh, uh, injury was standing out above all other type of the injury. So that is the major concern. So I assume on uh, the, you know, the drug was uh, floating around the blood to go to the different organs, and then it should create uh, some sort of the correlation between the different organ. Uh, that's a sort of the hypothesis we have behind trans organ. Cool. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's really impressive. And then my second question is, um, how do you distinguish between the dose related effects in your outcome? So for example, um, if you see that if, if you have like the data for 10, 30, 100 and 500 milligram uh, per kg dose, um, and you see that there is no changes at lower doses uh, or mid doses and only change at the higher dose, how do you take those uh, effect into account in your concordance table. And this is actually more in context to those match molecular pairs that you were describing, um, where, where you know, maybe for, for bad pair, maybe you are seeing the effect at all doses versus the good one, we are only seeing at the top doses. So I think I just want to know, like, how do you take this factor into account when you compute your concordance values? Thank you. This is it. 
Excellent question. Excellent questions. And uh, actually, we struggle quite a bit <laughs> when we're doing that. So when you're working with the same data set, like a TG gates, and this is pretty easy to address. But once you go beyond the TG gates, you look at the other data set, and then how you came to sort of the normalized the those they're using the different data set into the yours, the way the model was changed. And I put these slides up, just give you um, some ideas of what we do. So what we did in the TG gates, actually it's quite easy. We just break up the dose into the low dose, and media dose, and high dose, because this is how they did it. They look at the um, maximum tolerance dose based on the seven days and experiment. And then they um, sort of the incrementally uh, reduce the dose to define the high dose and low dose and media dose, which was uh, systematically apply every drugs um, they tested in the TG gates. However, um, so within the TG gates, there is no problem. And uh, actually was a partially addressed the questions you just asked. However, once you extrapolate the TG gates to the drug matrix, and we first of all, we found that the maximum tolerance dose it's based on the five days, not seven days. And I ask the toxicologist, let's say it was gonna make a, a big difference. They say, well, that's fine. Five days, six, uh, seven days, probably uh, it's okay. And then the most of them are two dose. Um, it's not three dose. So uh, we need to normalize them to the low dose, media dose and the high dose to become a little bit more difficult. So in a way, the dose, of course, we all know dose is the, is the one cause the toxicity. So how to normalize the dose eventually um, for the application of the tox again? And this is something we definitely needed to do a little more work on it. And uh, so thank you very much for this question. Thank you. All right, we're over time. So let's thank Dr. Tong for this excellent uh, presentation and basically a thesis defense of questions. So thanks for answering all those. All right, we're going to send out the recording to members and then also a uh, reminder that Cyril put in the chat and I can send around this work is published. So I encourage folks to do a deeper dive into the publication. So thanks everyone. Thanks Dr. Tong so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.